the documents committee and, and the AIA contract documents program really does try to develop documents that are fair and balanced and a good starting point for the parties. Business of Architecture, episode 236. Architect Nation, I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. On that page, you can enter in your best email address and you'll get instant access. And if you aren't at a computer, you can also text the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the award-winning platform that combines time and expense tracking, billing, project management, accounting, and business intelligence into one easy-to-use platform. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Contracts form a large part of what we do as architects because they form the basis for the services that we provide to our clients. Today, we are honored to be joined by Ken Cobley, the Managing Director and Counsel for the AIA Contract Documents Program. Today, we discuss the recently released 2017 AIA Contract Documents. A lot of thought and planning has gone into this latest revision, and whether or not you use the AIA Contract Documents in your firm, I think you'll find this conversation to be full of valuable insight about what to think about when you enter into an agreement with a client, especially considering the risks involved. So without further ado, here's today's show. Ken, welcome to the business of architecture. And I'd like to start off by asking you, what are the major things architects should consider as they are entering into these legal agreements? Sure. So the first choice is which contract. Um, And that starts with what delivery model um, do we want to use on a project? Do we want design bid build, which is the traditional historic delivery model where the architect designs and uh, once the design is completed, the owner engages a contractor to build that design. Uh, Do they want design build, which is a little different model. That's where the owner hires a design builder to to do both the design and the construction of the project. And then the design builder might engage an architect for the design element that it's ultimately responsible for. Or construction manager, is there gonna be a CM at risk? So first you have to figure out which delivery model are you gonna operate in. Um, Once you decide that, then you have to select the uh, right size, the appropriate owner architect agreement uh, for use on that project. And so let us take uh, the, the A201 family or the design bid build family of documents. Uh, We have uh, essentially five different owner architect agreements um, within that family and the right choice will depend on uh, project complexity and project risk. Um, So the the B101 is sort of our flagship document there and that's for medium to large size projects where there's that are fairly complex and where there's a fair amount of risk involved in doing the design and overseeing parts of the construction, you know, uh, contract administration. If it's a very simple project, um, not not complex at all, I mean, uh, an example might be a garage or a small addition on a house, then you might want to go with the B105, which is our uh, short form of contract agreement. And it's very basic. It's only uh, about three pages, uh, and and but it's going to contain far fewer terms, which leads more up for interpretation. So again, uh, first you need to know which delivery model you're going to be working in, and then uh, you need to select. It, in the case of the design bid build, you need to select the appropriate size agreement uh, for the project. And and uh, there are corollaries. So where I mentioned the B101, the A101 would be a corollary agreement for that. Um, so depending on the size on the architect side, there's a corollary owner contractor agreement. 
So Ken, tell me about the recent updates to the contract documents. Are, can you give me a summary of the major changes? Sure. Well, um, probably the most significant change that we made in 2007, which again, uh, relates to our design bid build family of documents, the A201 family, which is historically the, you know, the, the way design and construction first evolved. Um, the, the major change we made was to develop an insurance exhibit uh, for use in the owner contractor uh, agreements. Um, and we did that for a number of reasons. Um, other changes uh, include uh, the way we handle um, electronic information on a project. We enhanced uh, elements of both the owner architect agreement and the owner contractor agreements to deal with digital data um, and to deal with building information modeling. Um, we went to, uh, we developed an exhibit for use if they're in both the uh, owner contractor side of the uh, equation and the owner architect side of the equation if there's going to be significant elements of sustainable design and construction on the project. Um, and we made a number of other uh, changes uh, that we felt clarified things or helped enhance the project. Um, several of us have said uh, over the course of the past year since the, since the release came out that the changes in 2017 were evolutionary, but not necessarily revolutionary. That is to say, um, they reflected the evolution and change within the construction industry over the past 10 years and where things seem to be heading. Um, but nothing in them should be uh, shocking or are, are sea changes um, in, in either contract law or our documents. So two evolutions that you mentioned is some additional information about sustainability and then also you mentioned building information modeling. Tell me about the bid building information modeling. What changes have been implemented around that? So um, we have, over the, over the course of the past uh, eight or ten years, we have been working on uh, documents that specifically address digital data and building information modeling. And the most recent iteration of those documents is our E203, which is a digital data protocol and it addresses uh, digital data in all forms, including building information modeling. And then some uh, G forms that are used to really take a deep dive into protocols, the, the G201, deals with digital data generally. How are we going to handle emails, digital correspondence? Is there going to be a digital site, information site for the project? And then the G202 deals specifically with how are we going to handle and allocate responsibility for building information modeling. So in 2017, we built clauses into the documents that said that the parties were going to have an affirmative obligation to work on developing protocols for how to use, manage data that's transmitted digitally and what uses could be made of it. And specifically to develop protocols around the use of building information modeling. And we called out that they were going to, unless they agreed otherwise, they're gonna use our documents, the, the E203 and the G201 and G202 to establish those protocols. And we also said, with respect to building information modeling, if any party obtains a model before the protocols are memorialized in the document, and they use that model for any purpose, they use it at their own risk and without liability to any of the other parties, <clears throat> including the parties who may have created the model. So if uh, the architect and its design team have created uh, a model, and it might be a portion of the building, it might be the whole building, whatever, and develop that up to a certain point, and the contractor asks for that model, um, or the contractor somehow gets a hold of it, perhaps through the owner or whatever, and uses it. If they haven't established the protocols and, that include reliance rights, they haven't established that and memorialized it, then the contractor's use of that model is at its own risk 
and without liability to, to whoever gave it to them or whoever created it. Um, and the whole, the purpose of that is to get the parties to sit down and talk about who's going to be responsible for developing the model, at which phases, and to what extent, and then how can parties receiving it rely on it. But, but until that's memorialized, there's a whole bunch of extraneous data that could be contained in the model that, that the party creating it didn't intend others to rely on or even look at. And so those lines all have to be delineated and things need to be clarified um, before people run off and, and use the model for whatever purpose they think they want to use it for because they could be using data that was never intended for that purpose. So when we, yeah, when we think about building information modeling or BIM, what are some of the key issues that these parties are going to be negotiating and hashing out in this process? Uh, the, the key, th well, the key thing is model uh, content responsibility at each particular stage of the design and or construction. Um, so depending on, again, depending on the project delivery model you're using, those those elements are going to slide up and down a scale. But in the design bid build scenario, um, the expectation is going to be that the architect and its team has developed the model to a certain level for a whole host of model elements. The foundation, the structural steel, the concrete, the electric, the plumbing, whatever. Certain data is going to be expected to be in that model when it gets and and, and if the parties agree that they're going to exchange the model, then then there's going to be a level of reliance on the party receiving that model and information as they continue to enhance it and build on it as uh, the contractors, trade contractors, get in there and use it and perhaps add data about where ductwork or piping is going to go. So the parties first need to agree whether they're even going to exchange models. Uh, some design teams would say, we don't want to share our model because <clears throat> we don't want to drill down to the level of, of detail that's necessary to clearly share it. We just want to use it internally. But if they agree to share, then at certain milestones in the project, different parties are going to be responsible for ensuring that the data in the model is usable for certain purposes. Uh, some would be estimating down the road it's going to actually be designed and ultimately um, <clears throat> the model may be turned over to the owner for subsequent use in maintaining the facility and doing other things. So they have to decide are we going to are we going to even share the model and if so then at each phase along the way which which we can decide when the phases are um, for each line item, and, and if you look at our protocol, it's multiple pages of, of line items that we call the model elements, who's responsible for the data in the model, and what use can be made of that data. And, and all of that <clears throat> is, is why it's so important to establish these protocols up front, because once this project gets moving, um, people are going to be responsible for turning over certain portions of the model at different phases. And, and the content has to be right. And everybody has to have agreed, I understand what I can rely on it for and I understand what I can't use it for. So when we talk about use of the model, give me an idea of what we're referring to. Are we talking about, for instance, pricing, estimating, construction? Would those be considered uses? What are the use, what is meant by use? Yeah, so um, the, I, I, you're right. It, some of it is estimating, <coughs> some of it is is detailing work like duct work or, or detailing uh, pipe runs and so on and so forth. The best way to understand it is to um, look at our E203 uh, in the section that talks about um, the um, levels of development. There's a whole section in there that, that refers to that. And we have actually created language that is now being adopted by the industry at large for the levels of development for a model. And so it's sort of becoming a standardized nomenclature. We've licensed that uh, language for use by the uh, AGC's BIM forum in the development of their BIM spec. We've licensed it to the National Institute of Building Standards for the creation of a national BIM spec. 
We've licensed it to BIM Canada for the creation of documents in Canada. With the goal being that we're all going to try and standardize our understanding of this important concept of the level of development. Um, because the definition at each level tells you uh, what, what you can expect in the model and also what sort of reliance um, you might make uh, as a third party user, what reliance can be placed on that data. Um, so uh, really the best thing to do is look at the E203 and the level of development definitions and you'll see how it fleshes out, how, how a level 100 um, element is pretty rudimentary, pretty basic and you might be able to use it for some basic estimating, whereas level 500 um, should show great detail about the actual as constructed um, condition of the building. Let's let's jump back from a bird's eye view and just talk about the contract documents in a general sense. Maybe things that they have in common, despite you know not depending on delivery model. But if we were to look at that agreement that happens between uh, the most basic between an owner and an architect, what are some of the high points of the contract documents? Why they are so important to be used? One of the one of the key features that that we have in all of our uh, owner architect agreements that are uh, intended for use on contracts of, of any real uh, complexity or risk, so the B101, the B103. Um, we have a, a whole section on initial information. <clears throat> and, and we believe that initial information is really critical to the contract because it establishes the basic information upon which the architect is uh, basing its price, but also going to base its design and the way it will move through forward in developing the design. So the, the initial information uh, is intended to pull from the owner those things that, that are really important about the project, items that are really important to the owner, um, what the owner's program might be, uh, is there going to be uh, a sustainable design and construction element to this project. You know, are we seeking some sort of certification like LEED, or <clears throat> are there other health or uh, sustainability elements that the owner finds important that needs to be a part of this design, <clears throat> so on and so forth. And so we think uh, initial information is really important. Um, there are basic services that we all think about in terms of what we would expect from an architect and what architects would generally be expected expect of themselves to deliver call those basic services <clears throat> but there are other extraneous services that architects might provide on a, on a project and so uh, we also prompt the parties to talk about whether or not they want some of these enhanced services which we call uh, in the new nomenclature, we call them supplemental services. In the old nom nomenclature, they were uh, uh, one of two types of additional services. But, you know, something over and above the basic elements that every architect would expect to do, um, but, you know, but still within the architect's realm. So we deal with uh, basic services, supplemental services. Uh, we deal with how to, how to handle additional services if new things come along after the contract's uh, executed that, that the architect might be asked to uh, provide. Uh, dispute resolution is always uh, a critical topic. Um, pe the party should decide if there ultimately is a dispute on the project, how is it going to be handled? Are we going to mediate or not? Well, our documents, <clears throat> except for the very smallest one, which has no real dispute resolution terms in it, uh, other than you're going to court. Uh, we always try to prompt the parties to, to mediate first, and then they have to make a decision in the document up front. If mediation fails, are we going to litigate this? Are we going to arbitrate this? Because there's a big difference between going to court and litigating and, and using arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism. Are, are we going to try some other type of dispute resolution mechanism? So dispute resolution uh, is a critical component of the, of the, of the contracts. Um, 
I think another big area is what what is the owner's, with, particularly with respect to owner architect agreements, what is the owner's right with respect to the architect's instruments of service? And the instruments of service are the plans and specifications <clears throat> and other things that the architect prepares that define this project, define this building. Um, and we have a we have a fairly extensive licensing formula that we use in our documents. Some owners um, in manuscript documents uh, they they want complete ownership of the architect's instruments of service, but architects have always been reluctant to give up their intellectual property rights in their drawings and specifications for a multitude of reasons. Uh, sometimes because their drawings are absolutely unique, the design is unique, and the owner is only paying for one project. Um, so they shouldn't really have the ownership rights in that to cookie cutter this project multiple times. Uh, sometimes the architect has fairly uh, detailed specifications, uh, and they don't necessarily want to give up the intellectual property net because they use them repeatedly on projects, and they don't want any sort of ownership challenge to that. So uh, we try and juggle the owner's desire to be able to use the drawings and the specifications, not only to build the project, but to maintain the building later on, <clears throat> to add to it if necessary down the road. Um, so they, they want more than just the singular use of, you can only use it to build the project, and once the project's done, you can't ever use it again, you don't have a right. We want, we, we've expanded that while at the same time recognizing that the owner, that the architect retains the intellectual property in, in, in the instruments of service. So that's a fairly complex uh, licensing scheme, but we think it, it balances everything out and really works well. So I think those are, those are the biggies. Of course, uh, price, you know, the architect's fee, or in the case of the contractor, the contractor's fee, those are, uh, that's another big, uh, big element. But I, th I think that covers the, the main ones. Okay. Now, as, as you guys have gone back to provide an updated version of this, have there been any uh, court cases or litigation that you've looked at in terms of the way things that have changed or new things you're seeing in the terms of these agreements and maybe when these things go wrong? Uh, you know, <clears throat> historically, we have looked at stuff. I can't say, well, um, there, there's, uh, there was some, there was a clause added to uh, the in, the the material on the owner contractor agreement uh, that talked about the fact that there's no need for a claim in order for an owner to re retain liquidated damages. That that sort of arose out of some court cases where there's some question about whether or not an owner needed to first file a claim before it could withhold liquidated damages. We also cleaned up some information about when. Uh, when an initial decision was no longer necessary in, or, in order to proceed in the claims process, we we have a <clears throat> we have a rather unique um, sit, claim situation where a claim is all first submitted to initial decision maker, who makes an initial decision about who's right and who's wrong, subject then to the binding dispute resolution procedures, but it keeps the project moving. Um, we clarified that uh, once the uh, once the corrective period, one year corrective period after substantial completion was over, um, there was no longer a need uh, to get an initial decision. The parties could go right to binding dispute resolution for, for multiple reasons and, and a couple court decisions that were unclear about whether you needed uh, an initial decision before you could take the next step. So, so we clarified some stuff there. Certainly in the past, there have been some key court decisions <clears throat> that are prompted uh, certain clauses to be added. Probably one of the most uh, famous, well-known, uh, and, and, and for recent clauses is the Perini uh, case. It had to do with the construction of a, the renovation of a casino in Atlantic City. Uh, and ultimately, that case is what resulted in, in our, including a waiver of consequential damages in our documents. And, and also uh, the other groups that publish uh, agreements all, all went to a waiver of consequential damages. Uh, that was a case in which Perini was a, a construction manager on a renovation of, I think, a 
Sands Hotel in Atlantic City. Um, and the project uh, uh, ended a, f a few months late. The substantial completion came a few months late. Um, and the owners went to arbitration and claimed lost damages on the late opening of a hotel in Atlantic City. And so uh, I believe the arbitration award was $14 million offset by Perini's uh, total fee for all construction management services of about 600000 So the disparity in the award prompted everybody to say that's, that's too, nobody would have anticipated taking a hit that large uh, on a job where they were only paid 600000 and so we came up with a waiver. So we do that when there are big cases like that. I, I can't, there's nothing quite that big that came into play in 2017, but, but that's an example of when, when the big cases hit, we do something about it. Yeah, for some of the smaller firms that are using these documents, what what are the things that you want to tell them that they should be looking out for as they put these together? Um, sure. So <clears throat> we know that the smaller firms are always concerned about the length of the agreement, right? They they feel like they're working with owners, <coughs> excuse me, who perhaps don't want long agreements and so they're constantly looking for very short forms using s short forms i would say to them look you have to analyze the complexity of this project and the risk against the length of the form you use because um, when things go bad on a project you want as much spelled out in the terms as possible don't want the parties arguing over whether it's whether the the contract or the obligation should go this way or this way and and the only way you get to clarity is through through words through terms and so you really need to juxtapose um, the desire to have a short concise little contract against the the need to make sure you've covered the the, the critical things and if if dispute resolution is important to you then you want to understand what it is you want it agreed upon up front, you're, or, or otherwise you're going to just go to court, whether you like that or not. Um, if you want to make it clear that that you as an architect still own your instruments of service, then you want those terms spelled out in this contract and what the owner can use it for and what they can't use it for. Um, if you're going to use building information modeling, then you want something that uh, requires the parties to get the details down first before you start sharing your model and all of a sudden uh, wind up saying, no, 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 I didn't intend you to use it for this or whatever. So I would say to uh, to, to small pra firm practitioners, you need to decide what's, what's important and how much you don't want to argue about things later and how much you don't want left open to some third party to decide. Um, and then you be, then you decide what what form of contract is right for you. Um, and and uh, I would say that we have some members of our documents committee who are, are all AIA uh, architects. Uh, some of them do custom residential work and they use the B101, which is a fairly hefty agreement, and they use it because uh, they feel that at the end of the day, um, they can explain to an owner, even in a custom residential job, it's important that we have this understanding and it's important that both of our rights be clearly spelled out so that there's n less room to argue about them later. Which hopefully never happens, but sometimes does. So, you know, what, one thing that I know a lot of the smaller firms, they feel like the document because it is so complex that it's a little overwhelming to an owner and sometimes they're worried that all the legalese will scare away an owner or put them on the back foot. What would you say to a smaller firm practitioner who is, you know, dealing with that dilemma of wanting, of course, to reduce his or her own liability and the liability of their firm, but at the same time, they don't want to have a document that scares away potential clients or freaks them out, so to speak? Right. Well, I, again, I would harken back to what uh, what some of our documents committee members have said, and uh, and and sort of say to them, um, if you can explain to the owner what the key 
sections are and what the key clauses are. And you can explain to them that the contract uh, protects everyone, not just the architect, but everyone's rights. Um, and that there really is the, the contract, if they look at the contract as a good tool to provide a roadmap of exactly what is going, should be expected of the architect at various times, and also a clear roadmap of what the architect is going to expect from them, then, um, then I think that uh, many owners will, will accept that and understand that it, uh, you know, it, it is a tool for parties to understand what's going on. Not, you know, obviously not all owners feel that way, but again, <clears throat> um, you know, in, 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 a, in the case of a very uh, simple, uh, low risk project, you can probably get away with a lot less words. If you have an existing relationship with the client, you can probably get away with less words on a, on a low risk, simple project. But once you get into a realm where the potential for monetary loss to you as the architect or to the owner becomes significant, um, more than more than you would like to take a hit on, either uh, more than more than you could take a hit on and absorb it in your business without significant injury, or more than you've got insurance for. Then you, then you really want to uh, uh, use something that clearly delineates the terms. And, and that's a hard, sometimes a hard pill to swallow. But if you develop a, a sort of a, a presentation that you use over and over again, I think you can, you can soften up the owners and get them to accept that. Are you seeing any general trends where more sophisticated clientele uh, companies are basically saying, look, we don't want to use that contract. We don't want to use your contract. This is how we do it. And basically twisting the arm of the design team to take or leave their terms and conditions. Sure. Um, we know that happens in the industry all the time. <clears throat> um, some of us refer to that as the golden rule. Uh, <laughs> which is the which gold is. rules. Uh, you know, and, and because the owner has the has the gold, the client is the one paying. Um, they oftentimes try to uh, exercise that right. But we also know <clears throat> that there are a fair number of owners and a fair number of lawyers that, that advise owners that say, look, you're better served by a contract that represents a fair starting point and is fair to the parties. Because we all know that um, an onerous contract can result in higher fees because uh, the party that perceives that in, uh, a disproportionate amount of risk is being pushed their way is going to increase their fees to uh, to reflect the risk that they're taking on. Um, we also know that in some circumstances, uh, firms will walk away from a job if the contract is too lopsided because they don't want to take on that risk and they may not need uh, the commission. They may say the commi this commission is not worth the risk that we're going to take on this project. Um, we know that <clears throat> if using fair and balanced agreements will get the job started faster um, because people are not going to have to fight over terms. Uh, and we also know that uh, at times owners uh, add terms to contracts that are uninsurable. And so uh, it raises the question of whether or not the architect is going to be covered by liability insurance, which of course is bad at first blush for the architect if they don't, if they don't have coverage for the risk. But also it's bad for the owner because uh, the whole purpose of have carrying insurance is to help cover the monetary loss that might result from, from uh, the risk. And, and examples of that are uh, owners will sometimes write, write horrendous uh, clauses about the standard to which the architect will perform. Well, uh, they may think they're doing themselves a favor or their attorneys may think they're doing their clients a favor by writing these horrendous terms in. But the truth of the matter is uh, professional liability policies, policies will only respond to damages that arise out of a breach 
of the common law standard of care. That is to say, what a reasonably prudent architect would have done under the same or similar circumstances. So when the architect's contract says that it will perform without flaw to the highest degree possible, it automatically sets up a question and a fight over whether insurance is going to come into play because professional liability says, I don't have to, I don't have to respond for damages at that higher standard. We need to respond to damages uh, at that, that are a breach of the common law standard. Uh, another area where owners really think they're doing themselves a favor is, uh, is these very uh, intense contractual indemnifications where they, where they require that the architect indemnify and hold them harmless, defend, indemnify, hold harmless for uh, any damages that in any way remotely relate to the architect's work or, or at all. Some of that runs afoul of anti-indemnity statutes that some states have. But more importantly, again, professional liability policies will only respond for damages that are covered by com essentially common law negligence standards. <clears throat> and so if, if the architect wouldn't be obligated under the common law to indemnify the owner, these enhanced uh, indemnity provisions aren't going to be covered uh, by the insurance. And so uh, folks have to be careful uh, about that. Um, that's just a couple of examples of the common sort of onerous clauses. The ownership of the instruments of service that I mentioned before are also fairly common. Those are the kinds of onerous clauses. Um, and, and we find that uh, because we do a fair amount of education programming and I, I do a fair amount of speaking. Uh, when I talk about these topics, particularly to groups of lawyers, afterwards they will come up to me and say, we never realized that that was uninsurable. We, we thought we were doing our clients a favor, but now we realize we need to rethink that. So, so sometimes the lawyers who are drafting the contracts, uh, as well as the owners themselves, don't realize uh, that they could be creating this uh, trap for the unwary. As you're traveling, speaking, and teaching, are there any other common questions that come up that you can address for us to give some value to our listeners today? Um, I'm sure there are. Let me think uh, for a minute. Um, well, I think one of the one of the questions that comes up is why does the AIA uh, uh, have a ten year revision cycle? Um, and and a lot of people think, well, you know that the the um, <clears throat> the industry evolves sometimes much more rapidly than that. Uh, the answer is that. Um, the AIA contract documents program has been in existence for 130 years. Um, and over that time, they have considered all sorts of uh, questions like that. And, and what is the appropriate revision cycle? And um, after experimenting with shorter cycles and longer they come to the conclusion that 10 years is about the sweet spot because it affords the industry an opportunity to begin using the, the documents and then determining whether or not there are any shortcomings in the documents. <clears throat> if there are legal shortcomings, it gives, uh, and we hope that there aren't, but occasionally we need cases to wind their way through to see where courts are going to come out. <clears throat> and then we need time to start the next revision. So on a 10 year revision cycle, we actually begin looking at the documents seven years, seven, eight years into the cycle to give us uh, two to three years to revise the major ones. So for all of those reasons, <clears throat> we have found that 10 years is the right, is the right time. Um, <coughs> we also know that, uh, I apologize for that. <clears throat> we also know that um, parties don't like to study changes regularly. Um, part of the value in using AIA's contract documents is that um, the terms that are in there have, have developed over time and parties that grow accustomed to using our documents understand what's in them. 10 years is about the cycle where people are willing to go, okay, 
I'll now take the time to look at what the AIA has revised and come up to speed on that. So I'm now familiar with these new provisions and new nuances. They don't want to do that every two, three years. Um, and, and, and so, so the AIA's contract documents um, would lose value because because much of our value proposition uh, is is based on the fact that once you know, once you take the time to learn our documents, um, you only have to study the changes on essentially ten year cycles, and 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 so it's easier uh, as a professional to stay up on what's in them and to understand the evolving nature of the industry and the risk without having to spend design time or construction time restudying things uh, every couple of years. Um, and, so, and, and finally, uh, we do recognize that there are some times when the industry evolves faster than our documents. And when that happens, um, then we're prepared to uh, issue new documents that address those risks that can be incorporated into our existing documents. Examples, of course, would be include uh, building information, the, the building information modeling documents and elements where we address that rapidly evolving element of the construction industry without having to rewrite our documents. The same is true if you look at the evolution of, of the way we prepare documents to address uh, sustainable design and construction as that was rapidly evolving. Um, so we're prepared to do it uh, in segments like that, but we believe that the 10-year the process is tried and true. Uh, for the reasons I gave you, uh, the right fit. So I think that that's probably one of the biggest ones. Okay. Is there any other information that you feel is just essential that you would like uh, our audience to hear about the contract documents before we wrap it up? Um, I think it's really important for everyone to understand uh, that the document that the documents committee and and the AIA contract documents program really does try to develop documents that are fair and balanced and a good starting point for the parties. Um, <clears throat> there's some misconception in the industry that says that we are architect centric because we are prepared by the American Institute of Architects and, and therefore they must be architect protective. Um, and there are some architects who would say they probably should be. But the truth of the matter is the industry is best served by documents that, that represent a good balance and a fair starting point. A, a good document that the party, all of the parties can uh, look at and say, yes, we can use this, and it fairly lays out the roles and responsibilities and allocates the risk. So um, I think that that is, is, is very important and to understand that we spend a tremendous amount of time trying to garner industry feedback and working on these documents uh, to hit that goal. Fantastic. Thank you, Ken, for joining us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. Get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard-earned profit. And they have pricing structures that work for the smallest of sole practitioners to the largest of firms. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.